Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I am your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible author and transformational coach, Julie Hilson. Hello, Julie, and welcome to the show. Hi, Zach. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. Today, we are going to be talking about living a life of love. And for those that don't know, Julie Hilson is a certified angel practitioner, intuitive and transformational coach, and the author of Life of Love, A Joyful Guide to Self and Sensuality, where she shares her passion for living a life of magic and joy. Her master's in communication sciences and connections to spirit are blended within this book to share secrets about creating a unique life of deep, expansive love. Julia has her own weekly podcast, also entitled The Life of Love, where she hosts guests sharing inspiration, stories, connection, and community. How are you today, Julie? I'm super. I'm super. Spring has sprung in the South. And I know you said you're getting a rainstorm, but we our rain ended and finally the sun's out. So I'm giving you hope for your next sunny day out there on the West <laughs> Coast because it's on its way. I know it. <laughs> I appreciate that because, yeah, I thought I moved to sunny California and it was literally pouring and hailing last night and I was missing some sunshine. So I appreciate you sending some my way. And your life seems to be full of sunshine. You also have your own podcast where you interview guests on living a life of love. And even before I started my podcast, I thought I knew a thing or two about a thing or two. been researching love, sex, and relationships for a long time now. But I've learned so much from all of my guests. and It's been really wonderful. So I'm curious, what are some of the biggest findings, insights, lessons that you've gained from your guests on your podcast? Oh, my goodness. Well, the the abundance, I mean, just the the amount of people that I've connected with and their generosity of heart and their willingness to share their joy has been illuminating. I mean, I knew that I was committed to sharing and and elevating the frequency around me, but you know, just connecting on a daily basis to people who want to be in that same vibration has just been short of nothing short of a miracle. I mean, talk about living in magic, just, you know, having people come on your show and wanting to talk about these topics and be real and giving, it's just, it's an inspiration just in that. And then you get the messages, right? You have these people that want to share and then you get their messages and, and the angels are always around. I always invite them in. So there's always a surprise. And then a lot of times I'll listen back to the, you know, in the recording process, the editing process and the production there's more and more gems hidden in there. So every time I listen, it's just a new gift. And, and so, yeah, if I were to pick out, you know, episodes, it's, it's hard to say my favorites are the the best gift, but, you know, just insight, just when you, you think you understand your frame of mind, but then you listen to someone else and you're like, wow, that's a whole different way to look at it. And I think that's the secret to being happy and joyful is just having this curiosity, this curiosity of spirit, of soul, like of what, what else is out there? You know, what little, little crumb can this person give me that can go and take and make a banana bread loaf? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, (laughs) that's a delight to me. Absolutely. You know, I think of myself as committed to living a life of love. And it's easy to think that there aren't people like that out there because people are chasing after, say, money and financial material wealth and gain. But that's also been just really heartwarming for me in the podcast is connect with folks like you who are also committed to this really important work because I think we live in a very individualistic society that doesn't prioritize and even value love and connection and community. And I think that's such a great insight is that when you get down to it, the people, why they want all the status, all the prestige, all the things, it's because they want acceptance. They want love. So 
it just all goes back to this big circle. Like, how do you want to get there? Do you want to enjoy the ride or think that there's this luminous like finish line there for you to, to finally be the person you are meant to be or finally the stars will align to be with that perfect person when it's right there all along. It's just in, enjoying that journey. So, you know, it's, I have compassion for people who think it's this pie in the sky type, you know, whatever grandiose thing that you think it is. I have compassion because that's, that's a different road, right? And um, I'm just really happy that I had the struggle I had to, to to know that that joy and the love is is inside me, and and it's all about me expressing it that that brings that life of love. So I just love that. Yeah, I mean, you write in your book that you spend your life living in a love vibration, and you just mentioned struggle. So I'm curious, have you always felt this way, or did it take a lot of time to feel this way before we get into what exactly that feels like? Yeah, it it took time, honestly, and it took a lot of victimhood. Like I always have been sensitive. I've always wanted to feel a divine connection to another being. And I've always I've always sought the physical and, you know, serial boyfriends, high school, college, you know, me I married, you know, a really great guy. And and like, yet there's something missing. But the something that was missing was that I thought that it was outside of me. And I had to go through a lot of soul searching and, and going through feelings and feelings of abandonment, lack, all the things that everyone goes through, the highs and lows. And I still go through the highs and lows. Don't get me wrong. Like I have days where I'm like, I have to re- recenter myself because you, you know, fear does creep in. But, you know, through a lot of coursework, a lot of I didn't do a lot of counseling. I don't have anything against counseling, but to me, I, I needed to find my path myself and I never wanted to be medicated. That was like my biggest thing. If I was depressed, I had to figure out why I was depressed. I wasn't going to cover it up with the medication. And I understand, and I'm not judging anybody who takes medication at all, but I'm a really sensitive person. Like I will react. Like I can't take a lot of the drugs for pain. I just, I'm a canary in the cave. Like if there's going to be a problem, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one that shows that there's a problem. So <laughs> I, I have to watch my, my exposure, like really. So that gave me a lot of insight because I had, you know, go through all these things without any outside help, except what I, what I wanted to learn, what I wanted to read, the courses I took and, you know, and I, I condensed it all down to, to what I needed to feel loved and how I needed to love myself. So yeah, it was, it was a journey and a lot of a lot of days crying, trying to figure it out and saying, God, show me, show me what I need to know. Because, you know, I, it wasn't like my husband was abusing me or I had a stroke or, you know, any traumatic event, but I just knew there was something more. And I was living the life that everyone else expected me to live instead of living my soul. Yeah, hearing from you reminds me of this idea from... Alan Watts, a philosopher, that the ultimate taboo in society is looking within. In other words, like we're told, you know, knowledge is to be gained outside by reading a number of books or success is to be gained in the external world that we have to search the world over to find the one to experience love or we're told happiness, fulfillment, connection is this and this and this all of outside of ourselves. And I too am amazed, you know, I went to like 16, 18 uh, years of education and no one ever told me to close my eyes and look within and listen to my breath or get in touch with my heart. So I wouldn't mind just learning more about what you find or what you have found uh, by looking within. So when you use this term soul, for example, when you use this term spirit, what exactly does that mean to you? Oh, well, the soul is with you throughout eternity. The soul is your connection to your divinity, to source. Spirit is something outside of you. You can have spirit, you can be a spirited person, but my definition of spirit is anything outside of the 3D that you can connect with, that you can't touch, feel, smell, sense within the 3D. It might be an intuition, a gut feeling. Um, I say feeling, that's a little misleading, but like a, and a lot of times intuition comes as a feeling. So yeah, it's it's a crossing over of dimensions when you go to the spirit and the soul. The soul can cross dimensions, but that takes some practice, and that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, earlier you said you you felt like you condensed it all down after some years of struggle. So what do you feel that you condensed it all down to? Well, a life of love 
is consistently cho choosing things that support you. So that can go in a lot, a lot of different ways, but I broke it down into three main categories, knowing, knowing what brings you joy, knowing that you are a divine person, that you have every right, it's your divine right to be abundant with love and happiness. And we're here, we're here to express that love and see that love reflected in other people. Like that's your divine right. Nobody's privileged to have love. It's, that's a basic, you're, you're a divine being. And you have these, you have this chance in this life to show up and to have these challenges and to, to do your best. And that might me mean falling down on one day. And it might f mean feeling that you're lacking, but these challenges are there to advance your soul in your ascension. So this first step is to just to get to know who you are and what brings you joy. And it doesn't have to be like this huge thing. It can be like, well, what's your favorite color? What are your favorite types of jokes? Who, wh how do you like to spend your free time? Just basic everyday things. And so then once you get to know your light and what brings you joy, then then you have to look at how are you treating your vessel, your avatar while you're here on earth? This is your body. Like you have to take care of your body. You can't, you can't expect to have a joyful life if you're neglecting your body. Like you have to take your car in for oil changes. You have to check in <laughs> with your body. You know, like we, you can't run your body till the service light comes on, dude. So you're going to end up with like disease. Like that's lack of ease, <laughs> disease, when you ignore yourself and your needs. So basic things like drink your water, get your exercise, move, you know, like movement frees your soul. And I have, I have graphics in my book to explore different ways to move because there again, we have these paradigms in our society. You have to join a gym. You have to take classes. You have to go to yoga. No, you movement is free. Like do what you like. If you like to go look at birds, if you want to go mushroom hunting, if you want to go on a I don't know, some kind of scavenger hunt, like whatever gets you moving is exercise. You don't have to do exercise in this framework of, of what marketing says exercise should be. <laughs> so I, I tell people, you don't have to be fit to get exercise. You don't have to be athletic to get exercise. Just get out and move. Do what brings you joy. Don't do what people expect you to do. <laughs> so, and um, just be ready to move it with joy. And um, oh, I have a cool story. Can I interject it? Well, let me just, so let's just summarize real quick. Cause you mentioned there were three things. The first yeah, one yeah. is know who you are and what brings you joy. And the second one is look at how you are treating your vessel. And the third one is dynamics of relationships, because the things that come up in relationships are mirrors to you. So anything that you're contributing to, as far as a conflict, like you have to say, okay, how, how did I let this get here that I got to a frustration level or how am I contributing to this feeling of frustration? Because it's always, you didn't show up your best way and you weren't aware that you were getting frustrated because you can always say, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, I, I don't, this is feeling weird. Or you can always, you can always like stop and, and take a pulse of a situation before it escalates into a conflict. But it takes, you know, reading your tension, taking a short time to just, calibrate to what's happening because not, you know, not everything has to escalate, but when things do escalate, you have to know how to reset and how to forgive. And honestly, Zach, most of the times it's forgiving yourself first for being agitated because once you can forgive yourself for feeling the way you feel in the situation, then you make space for the other person to not be in control. Like you don't, you don't give them the power to make you upset anymore because you've owned you've owned how you've contributed and you've given them space to not defend themselves. They're not in a defensive state because you've, you've recognized how you've contributed and you're, you're here to, to make the situation better and not to blame them. Because in a place of blame, you're just going to get defensive and the ego takes over and we've all walked that walk. And then it's like, okay, you can say, I don't want to show up that way again. I'm going to show up how I want to show up this time. And a lot of times we get stuck in these, oh, this is my role. And sometimes you just need to say, no, that's not my role today. I'm showing up differently and just make that choice to show up differently. And every moment's a chance to live the life of your dreams because you don't have to repeat what you did. 
you don't have to dig your your feet in the sand and repeat the same mistakes over and over. Because I think a lot of times people have identity with how they've reacted in situations before, and then they just jump into these roles. And sometimes you just got to shake things up and there's never change without instability. So, you know, don't be afraid to shake up your relationship every once in a while and ask the hard questions, because that's how you get to another level is to just go there. (laughs) It's scary. It's scary to ask hard questions. But once, once you, you say, I'm, I'm ready for the answer and you identify when you're in fear because fear and love can't coexist. They just can't. And that's fear is the biggest obstacle to any love at all. I feel like if I were going to sum up these three steps, I might do it as self-knowledge, self-care and loving relationships, perhaps. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> okay, so what's your story? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's the, about the movement. I met this lady, Rama, and yesterday, yesterday I decided I was going to go hike Stone Mountain because I found out it is a sacred feminine ley line and it's only an hour from my house. So I was like, I'm going to go. And it was, you know, it was like sprinkling the whole way there and I almost turned around twice because the weather wasn't great, but I just went anyway. And I paid, I paid for the annual parking pass. And I was like, I'm going to commit. I'm going to go here. So I pull up and I park and I look up and there's this beautiful woman and she's amazing. She is like doing this little, not a big dance. She wasn't being showy, but she's just moving with happiness. And I just smiled and I nodded that I, that I saw her and Rama and I, we just had a moment and she's like, I need to tell you something. And I was like, okay, I'm here. <laughs> Total stranger. I've never seen her before. And I just, I hope I get to see her again. She's like, I lost 150 pounds and I come here every day to work, to walk. And I said, that's beautiful. That's just amazing. And here she does eight miles a day and has just committed wow. to losing. And I lost a, a, an extra person's body weight. Like easily a person can weigh 150 pounds, right? And here she's lost that in the last two years. And I was just so... I was so inspired by her and I was just so honored that she felt like she wanted to share that. And I was only there to celebrate the sacred feminine. And here I got to meet this beautiful soul. And it was like, it was like the angels were putting us together. Like I was just drawn to her and she was drawn to me. And we just shared things about our life that you wouldn't typically share with a stranger. But I felt like, you know, like the the stars lined up that we were pushed together to have this affirmation, this experience that we are both at the right place at the right time. And um, so that's, that's part of the magic that I I recognized. And I did, I thank the angels. I I said, thank you for bringing Rama and I together today. That was really special. And I didn't have another encounter on the mountain like that. Again, it started raining and it was windy, but I, I made it up and down (laughs) because that was my mission. But yeah, that was, it would, if I would have just turned around and got back in my car, it would have been worth a two hour drive. Yeah, I love those magical synchronicities, huh? just those lovely little connections. I'm a little curious about actions and practices uh, to implement some of the things that I'm hearing from you. For example, I'm curious how spiritual practices like everything from yoga to meditation to Tai Chi might come into place or self-care practices that you recommend when you talk about how I'm treating my vessel. Once I finish this podcast, should I be taking a bubble bath with some some beautiful music going on? Or what do what does this uh, look like? Yeah, Epsom salts are awesome. I have to tell you, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what the beauty of it is. It looks like how you want it to look, and it could change every day. For example, some days I wake up and I do a yoga flow, and sometimes I do Tai Chi when I'm walking my dog. When she stops to sniff, I'll do my little energy movements when I'm, I'm pushing the energy ball around. I adore essential oils. They raise your frequency. I mean, it's just following your joy, doing what you like. And, you know, a lot of times I'll recalibrate by going out and hearing the birds calling back and forth. And I learned that's binaural beats, you know, Mm. and, Mm -hmm. and people pay for these meditations and all honestly, a lot of times you just need to go outside and listen to the birds and you're Mm -hmm. going to get the same frequencies that you paid $80 for (laughs) that you have to like sync up. So um, yeah, I mean, there's sacred geometry in in a flower. If you just gaze at a flower, you're you're getting healing frequencies at a cellular (laughs) level. 
<laughs> a soul level. <laughs> A solar soul. <laughs> solar soul, yeah. <laughs> it's like solar power. I don't mean to be like, you know, flippant about the answer. It's just like, Zach, it's it's really up to what you think will feel the best at that moment. And just taking, you know, if you, I have in my book, if you have five minutes, these are things you can do. If you have 10 minutes or if you have 30 minutes, things that you can do to recalibrate. A lot of people like to meditate. Find your favorite meditation. I love um, bringing in the golden bowl. It's a heart meditation where you picture, you visualize something you deeply love and you tell it that you love it. And then you, you envision your heart turning to gold and then bubbling out this, this foamy, like almost beer foam, but it's honey and it's gooey. And this golden iridescent substance fills your heart and your neck and your head. And then it shoots down through all the parts of your body and it's clearing and energizing each one of your energy centers up through your chakra. And then it, it oozes out all over your environment. And so that's like a quick four minute meditation that I just adore it. And it lasts for 24 hours. So, and I love my crystal bowls, you know, like I'll, I'll strike those and I'll just ask for clearing. And so, I mean, it's just, you find what resonates with you and that's what it needs to do. It needs to resonate with you. You need to feel the change. You need to believe in it and whatever that is, just visit it, visit it. And huge, huge, huge thing that our whole society needs to just get to is just, I am and don't finish it. Just be okay with I am. Because we always want to put that I am. I'm, I'm what? No, you just are. You're a precious being because you are. You don't have to fill in the blank. I love that. We are precious beings. <laughs> I hear you like encouraging following our path of highest excitement and figuring out what works best for us. And I do wonder if there is any quote unquote wrong things for me to do or perhaps misguided it was very interesting. I was recently reached out by this podcast and it was called something like Mindfully Outdoors. And I was like, oh, I love being mindfully outdoors and paying attention to the natural world around me. And it was a podcast about hunting other animals. And I was like, oh, mm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I, was like, how I feel about this. Is this possible to mindfully shoot and kill an animal because I just come from a very large stance of nonviolence. But I'm also just thinking about somebody who's like, oh, my my path of joy sounds like playing video games and ordering pizza. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> so is there anything I need to, that is there any advice or guidance you might have? I mean, is all past the correct path because I'm following my truth or are there ones that are perhaps better than others? Well, that's a huge thing that I have is um, to understand polarity and how judgments can, can affect your happiness. Because when you catch yourself judging somebody else's path, that's also a reflection of how you're judging yourself. So it's, it's a tricky thing because, you know, we need people to thin the herd and it might not resonate with you, but that might be something that fulfills them for whatever reason. And is it the highest ascension path? Is it the most enlightened way to be? Maybe, maybe not. Like, <laughs> I think the biggest thing is like, we don't know anything. Like we, we literally know nothing and just come into the, to the place of non-judgment, just observing. And if that can bring them joy and they can feed people and, and their divinities expressed with the, being outside and feeling alive because they've conquered something. I mean, I can't take that away. Could I do that? Could I look at the big doughy eyes of a deer and take it out? Yeah, no, I couldn't. And I could barely watch someone do like I, you know, I, I grew up with, um, we had some farming, a lot of my mom's side of the family were farmers and my uncle processed a cow right there and I couldn't eat meat for a while. <laughs> like a lot of people are more sensitive, right? But, you know, hunting and giving respect to an animal can be a beautiful thing. And I, I can say it resonates more with me than the commercial production of meat and what they do in slaughterhouses, you know, and, and that fear that's happening in there. So I think it's all about, you know, reading the energy around if you're being respectful and, and you're coming from a place of divinity versus, you know, somebody who's disrespecting or 
intentionally causing harm, like in a painful way to an animal, that's a whole different thing. So I think you have to look at the intent and try not to judge. But if you have a strong feeling that person is is acting out of hate, and obviously you have an obligation to to say something. So yeah, it, it, that can into a whole a whole thing. But I think mostly it's it's like intent and um, respect and trying not to judge. And you, you know, you can always say that doesn't resonate with me, but have you know, that's your path. And then you remove yourself from a situation that's uncomfortable for you because you shouldn't be uncomfortable because someone else has a path. But yeah, I, <laughs> that's, I, I would have a hard time being on that show and, and bringing out the highest good of it. It would be a challenge for me, but maybe that's the universe was giving you a challenge. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just <laughs> thinking, I'm, I'm going to have to think, like, is Putin... Like, is Vladimir Putin following his path of joy, like doing what he thinks is right? Mm, there's karma, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, like, and anytime I hear in the news, somebody, you know, there's, there's like this story, right? Like, I'm not in charge of that person's karma. And, you know, me being brought into the drama of what they did doesn't help the situation, but I can send love and light to anyone affected. And I can... I can ask for the highest good to happen because, you know, there, there are, there are both sides to every coin and, and you can't see the darkness without, you can't see the light without the darkness. And, and that's what we're here as humans. We're here to make choices and we're all going to, we're all going to be accountable for our choices. And there's always the bad choice. There's always the lowest timeline. And then there's always the highest timeline. And I think the secret is to consistently pick the higher frequency choice, but that doesn't mean the person that picks the lower frequency is not needed because without any adversity, then we don't have this playground to, to choose the right thing for us at the time. And, you know, everybody has a role. I mean, you can look at, look at some of the Broadway plays with like wicked and, you know, they're, they're trying to shine light on that. And we always have the good witch, bad witch, but you know, maybe, maybe both of them should be honored for their contribution, even if it doesn't resonate with us. Yeah, I'm reminded of that quote. I believe it's attributed to the Bible that we're so quick to point out the splinter in another person's eye, but not acknowledge the log in our own. And <laughs> the whole pot calling the kettle black deal, right? Yeah. Don't throw rocks if you live in a glass house, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's what I feel like a lot of this is about is really shoring up our own work focusing on our own path and healing and seeing how a lot of violence in the world is propagated by those who think that they're right, everyone else is wrong. So I will force, you know, my way of doing things onto others rather than cultivating a peace within ourselves that we can then just exude as we go about into the world. So I'd love to get a little bit more into that love inside of us that we can cultivate, discover, and find. And some say love is the great ineffable. Some say love is who we are. I'm curious what love means to you. Well, love is the only reason we're here. It really is. So it's it's a constant, it's a constant um, place I try to reside. I really don't think you should look at it as work you should look at as a state and it's a constant calibration and self-reflection and compassion and i know you want to talk about unconditional love because you know sometimes Always. love <laughs> shows up you know like you can love your kid and, and still yell at them for being a bonehead you could be like well you know <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes love's a little tough, right? It's not always butterflies and rainbows. So that unconditional love that, you know, that you that you will accept yourself even when you're in fear, that you'll look at the fear and and try to figure it out instead of stuffing it away. And you're just honoring, honoring your divine being that you're here to love. And if you're not feeling that, have the bravery to look into it. And not wallow in it. You don't want to look into it to wallow. You want to look into it to figure it out, to accept it, make space for growth, and then deal with it. So the next time it resurfaces, you might not spend as much time with it, but you've honored it so that you can ascend to the next lesson. Because I really do believe it's all about lessons to, to love yourself better, to be a better lover, 
because you know when you when you love yourself you radiate that that golden goo and it it transforms everyone around you whether you believe it or not it's a powerful force and and we're all energetic beings so the energy you're putting off truly affects not just your life not just your families but the universe and to own that power our biggest fear is that we're unlimitedly full of power <laughs> Once you accept that you're a powerful being, that you can affect everything around you and and you have that power, then that is is a really enlightening thing. And then you have this responsibility, like I I need to show up. Like we made this appointment and you showed up and I showed up. And and when I have appointments with other people in the podcast world, it's very rare that people don't show up. We're showing up for each other. And that changes that changes a dynamic and the, the listeners that tune in regularly, they're raising their frequency. And we have no idea these little, you know, they say ripple effects or, you know, the, there are photons, there are energetic quantum activations that happen and we can, we can affect it by being positive, by being supportive, by showing unconditional love saying, you know, even if we don't agree with somebody saying, you know, I have compassion for your situation and I see you. And you don't have to say, I do the same thing. You don't have to support their bad choices, but just see them and let them know that they're important because, you know, we're all here to help each other. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting to live in that world of, of, I can make a change and I don't, my ego doesn't need to be showered with millions of dollars and it doesn't need to be like given you know, awards and accolades, like that's your ego. Your ego wants constant affirmation that you're doing the right thing, but doing the right thing is just living, living your purpose and being happy. We don't need our, we don't need the external validation and you'll, you will get synchronicities. You'll get signs that you're doing the right thing. Just like I did yesterday when I drove through the rain to hike a mile up to the top of a mountain. <laughs> you know, like I got a sign from the universe that I was doing the right thing. Did I get a million dollars? Did I win the lottery yesterday? No, but I don't need that. Like the ego, the ego will constantly ask for affirmation and it's your job to say, thank you, ego. I understand you're trying to take care of my bank account, but <laughs> I just got these great signs from spirit. So I'm good. <laughs> you know, like we're abundant. <laughs> I love that. Doing the right thing is living your purpose and being happy. And you brought up something I wanted to learn more about because at the beginning of the interview, you mentioned that fear is the opposite of love. And I was curious what that fear was. And what I just heard is that there is a fear that we have unlimited or perhaps limitless power. So I'd love to get yeah more into that along the lines of, okay, if fear is the opposite of love and fear is one of the greatest obstacles to love, what is it that people are most afraid of that's most getting in the way? And how do we, well, what do we do with that <laughs> once we acknowledge the fear? Well, I, th I think that's the biggest thing is to acknowledge that you have fear. And I, I think it's part of our DNA. I mean you think about our ancestors, they had to fight off predators and they had to scourge, you know, scrounge for food. And, you know, we needed the fight, flight or freeze response. And I think that there's a lot of things in our world that can trigger that quickly. I mean, you just turn on the news and you can get it triggered. You can, you can read a comment on one of your posts online and, and you can feel your heart just get shrink like and your blood just go to your extremities because you're like I didn't mean it like that you know like I just I didn't want to show up that way and, and you know you get to this defensiveness and um it can happen really quick and it's just being aware like follow your heartbeat your heart will tell you when you're in a stressful situation even if you're not consciously you know if you're scrolling through things if you're just going through your day and you're you're feeling these these stressors and we have to, we have to deal with stressors because we live in the 3d. I mean, I'm not saying stay in your house and, and meditate all day. You have to, you have to go <laughs> through these things, but when you have this kind of stressor, when you have the, you want to, you want to zip back a reply, you want to fight with them or you want to run and hide, like acknowledge that that's where you are and then take a moment to ask for the highest good. And this is where I might bring in my angels. I'll be like, angels, show me the highest possible outcome of the situation. And sometimes I don't hear anything and it's because I just need to let it sit and let it settle. 
And so that's one of the Tao's, Taoisms is to um, wait for the pond to settle, to see the clarity of a situation. Sometimes the best response is a non-response. And that's the most powerful thing you can do is just not react. And we've lost sight of that. We, we're, we're this, we want to see an action reaction. And that's sort of ingrained in our society. But I know that when my kids mess up and I just look at them and I say nothing, I they get know. so much more information yeah. <laughs> about where they're coming from than if I were to ask them. Like things will come up. And I was like, oh, that's what he was thinking. I would have never even gone there. But just a look, like that's that's your power to respond or not respond. Not responding is a power. That's that's really cool. And once I figured that out, it was like, okay, but you know, you just have to figure out where you are and and what your options are and and respond instead of react. Give your chance yourself the chance to do that. And I want to let people know they have the option to do that. Like, but you have to get out of the adrenaline state. You have to calm your heart. You have to bring in a breathing technique, you know, four breaths in, hold for four, four breaths out, you know, breathing in for the count of four, holding, breathing out for the count of four, do that four times. And, and you can sort of reset your, um, your nervous system a little bit, because if you're not aware of what your nervous system is doing, then your fight, flight, or flee situation will take over. And, um, and I think a lot of, it, we're, we're not teaching kids this in school and we don't, you know, it's not part of a parenting manual. <laughs> so these are all things that you have to sort of observe and hopefully you pick up or, or you study. And, you know, so I want to, I want to empower people to, to just be present with their bodies and see what's going on so they can, they can make the best choice. And that's where the angels have helped me figure out that a lot. So, you know, just calling in the angel, angels, my guides, whoever's here to help me today, show me what I need to see for the highest good. That's a really great way to, to access how Help, because we don't have to do this alone. The angels have assignments and, and we can help them reach their goals too. So uh, we're connected to this great network. It's just a matter of saying, hey, I need help. Help me <laughs> reach out. <laughs> yeah, I agree with so much of what you're saying. I do think that fear is basically a leftover byproduct of our evolution. It was very useful when we were running from tigers and approaching a cliff to have a certain level of fear that geared our body up for fighting and fleeing, but not so much now. Uh, and it often just gets into an overreactive mode when we're with our partner. For example, this person we're trying to love and our stress response system is getting activated. So I love your advice on how important it is to learn to respond rather than react. Learn to take a few deep breaths you know, when we do notice ourselves getting triggered in certain situations in our life. And that sometimes, as you mentioned, the best response is not responding or not reacting in this case out of fear, judgment, criticism, but waiting for a few moments to call upon uh, a higher, more mindful, uh, more loving aspect of ourselves. So you've mentioned it a few times. And as we're winding down, we have to figure out who are these angels you speak of. You're a certified angel practitioner. And I don't know if you've seen this lately, but there's a lot of like artists who are like, this is what a biblically accurate angel looks like. Because we do have this image of an angel that of this human being with wings, probably a halo, white robes, <laughs> and perhaps a harp in their hand. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when like the biblical version is actually just like, like thousands of eyes like swirling around and, and super wild and crazy. But what does this term mean to you? And how do you use it? My angels are the energetic guides who come to me. And I have a team and the team is constantly evolving and and solidifying. And depending on who I'm connecting with, I sense that my angels form networks with the other people's angels. So it's it's a network. It's a network of help, of inspiration. So do I have visits where the angels ascend on my bed when I rise in the morning? No. <laughs> like, the <laughs> angels, I mean, angels have appeared to people, but it's at great peril to them. I mean, that is not easy for them. They 
they are in their realm and we are in our realm. We can rise, raise our vibration to get clearer messages. And there's, there's people who spend a lot of time connecting to the ether and to the outer world world. And that's not me. I'm very connected to the earth. And so I, on my vibration, I connect to my guides, but I'm not going to hold, I'm not going to spend all day astro traveling to visit the different dimensions to to visit different beings because I have so much work to do here. Am I curious about it? Do I like to hear stories about people's astro travels? Heck yeah. I re- I've read books and I'm really, really, you know, I'm in admiration of people that can do that, but I have so much on the ground that I need to do that I, I can't spend time doing that. But I can say that the more you ask and the more you honor the contribution, then the stronger the stronger your connection is. And, and how I know is I get signs. I hear songs on the radio that answer my questions. The biggest thing is to know a question to ask, right? And then, you know, I also get, I get little shapes of paper that just will appear that give me a sign. You know, some, some people read tea leaves. Well, I, I think it's little pieces of paper that I find. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's just like things that you could disregard that you take notice of, you know, birds to come and visit me, you know, the number of birds that sit on a branch and stare at me in the morning when I'm walking my dog, I can go and look up a sacred number that relates to that and I'll get a message. So it's, it's different every day. I have to tell you what the signs and synchronicities are, but it's asking that question and being, being connected to the help that's around you and not, not having to have you know, like a bop on the head or some kind of transformational experience. Now I've talked to people who've had near death experiences and, and the beings that come to help them transition or go back into their bodies are always something that they relate to that it would not be scary to them. So it might be the image of Jesus. It might be the angel with the harp that meets them, whatever that person's guides think is going to be the least um, intimidating or the most friendly or easy for them to accept. That's the image that that entity will take. But there's not a form to the angels that come to me. That, that That's just not how it works. It's It smells, it's dreams, it's, you know, you know it because you feel a tingle. It's a different dimension because it's not, it's not dense like we have here. And so, yeah, if you can just open yourself up to it and, and know that, like, I'm not gifted. I've just decided to ask and receive. Like, Anyone can do it. It reminds me of a visualization exercise I sometimes do with my students where basically I envision them meeting their teacher and it kind of starts out with thinking of this amorphous entity coming towards them and then it turns into their teacher and it's quite incredible who it turns into for people. Sometimes it's an ancestor, like their grandmother appears to them. Sometimes it's an important historical figure like the Dalai Lama or Desmond Tutu or Mother Teresa. Sometimes it's the Buddha or or Jesus, other, you know, bodhisattvas and and gods and and devas and devatas. And I feel like it's both separate and a part of us at the same time. That like you do have a part of you that you can call upon for a higher wisdom and guidance to help you in your life. I agree. I agree. And I've even said that the angels are there to show you what's inside you. As we're winding down, I'm curious if you have a pep talk for our listeners. After all, your website is you need a pep talk.com, if I'm not mistaken. Let's yes. say I'm a listener. <laughs> I don't have I don't feel joy. I don't feel love. I feel life is a burden and I'm stuck going from home to work to home, overstressed, lonely. Do you have a pep talk for me? I'd say, dear one, you you are a precious gift and you woke up with the source of life in your lungs this morning. You woke up in a bed. You woke up with a pillow and sheets and you took in clean air as you filled your lungs and not to make you feel bad, but you didn't appreciate that, did you? You didn't appreciate the way your heart beats and the way it's thumping and and trying to reach your soul. You didn't go there, did you? Because you let the weight of the world, the programming affect you. And that's okay. The programming is real. But you have a choice, my dear one. You have a choice to have gratitude for the things that are supporting you everywhere. Everything around you is supporting you. 
Choose to see it. Choose to see the people who notice you. Choose to appreciate the feet under your legs, the strength in your body. Choose to let the shower ionize the negativity that's thrown around you. Choose to clear your field. Choose to breathe in light and choose to shine, my dear one, because you were born to shine. And anything that dims your shine is something that needs to be transmuted and transformed. You need to take these frustrations and thank them for showing you what needs changing. These frustrations, these lows are gifts for you to take, to shake, and to move out. Thank them for the sign. Thank them for their wisdom and let them go because these frustrations are not you. These frustrations are things you need to work on. But first, you need to have gratitude for your resources and see the abundance. Enjoy your food, drink your clean water. And let the divinity come in because you are here for a reason. It is no coincidence that you woke up this morning and you breathed in your lungs full of pure air. You are a gift and you are special and I love you. (sighs) Goosebumps. Wow. (laughs) That was like spoken word poetry. (laughs) That was angels. I I asked my angels to give us the message that we needed. (laughs) Wow, I might need to pull that audio out and just make it its own own little thing. People can put <laughs> some ambient music to it or something. So, wow. Thank you so much, Julie Hilson. <laughs> I do have to finish by asking you my final question. I ask all of my guests, which is, what do you wish everyone knew about love? I wish that everyone knew that they were born to love. And they were divine spirits. And that divinity is seen in everyone. Everyone is a divine being. And that love is a birthright. So sharing and living in your love is your purpose. It's your highest calling. However it, however it appears in your life, it's not how it's reflected in somebody else. It's not what someone else is doing. You can go to work and, and take tolls on the side of the highway, and you can do that in a love vibration. You can pick up the garbage with a love vibration. You don't have to have a specific calling to be a priest or a a nun or a social worker. It's, It's your love and how you're showing up and the things that you do to get through your life. So, you know, just take that and and try to stay in that and you can change the world and we can change the world one moment at a time and every moment's the chance to live the life of your dreams. So just choose it. Wow. That's the sequel to the pep talk right there. That is so encouraging (laughs) and so promising and so lovely. Ah, Thank you so much, Julie Hilson, for coming on to the show. The author of Life of Love, A Joyful Guide to Self and Sensuality. For our listeners who want to learn more about you, how can they find you? On my website, you need a pep talk.com. That's a that's a hub of all my things. My podcast is on there. It's also on Spotify and all the all the platforms. Um, I also started putting things on YouTube. So <laughs> find me life of more love, a joyful guy. <laughs> you know, I do need to do more pep talks. I, you know, it's funny. I started that website, I don't know, 15 years ago just to give like recipes and I wanted people to support each other. And, and then I started my angel work af- long after I had the website. So it's just evolved and I could never change the title of it because it's my domain and I've worked on it. So it's, it's really fun to see how I've changed in my, my approach to things. Yeah. I I should have just a separate pep talk, you know, page (laughs) on my website. I I thank you for that idea, Zach. (laughs) (laughs) That's my pep talk to you, Julie. You're doing amazing. Keep up the awesome work. (laughs) You're precious. Oh, thanks, Zach. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. A lot of times I read my stuff and I was like, yeah, the angels wanted me to remember that. So a lot of things I I put out there is for myself too. (laughs) (laughs) It's awesome. Thanks for creating this beautiful container for us to share, Mm. Zach. Yeah. So thank you for coming on to the show and thank you listeners for listening to the show. We hope you remember all the valuable lessons that Julie shared with us today, including one secret to being happy and joyful is being curious, including to spirit and soul. To live a life of love is consistently choosing things that support you. Know who you are, what brings you joy. Look at how you are treating your vessel. Take care of yourself, love yourself, and and understand the dynamics of your relationships. 
Remember that love is the reason we are here. We are born to love. Sharing and living love in your life is your purpose and highest calling. And there are guides to help you. If you want to learn more about me, you can go to zachbeach.com and learn more about the show at theheartcenter.com. Thanks again, Julie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to zachbeach.com or theheartcenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 